All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining SNUFA today. I am going to be chairing the first session. My name is Melika Pevand. And today, for the first speaker, we have the pleasure of having David Kappa with us. David um, is a research group leader at Ruhr University Bochum, if I spelled that correctly. And um, he has interest in computation on neuroscience, um, efficient machine learning, and he's also worked with uh, neuromorphic algorithms or developed the algorithms for neuromorphic hardware. Um, so we are very happy to have you here, David, and we look forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Melika, for the invitation, and also thanks to Friedemann and Dan. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. So yeah, I called my talk um, Spike King Neural Networks for Efficient Machine Learning, and I'm going to give an overview of um, what my group has been doing in the last couple of years. And also, I want to jump right into it. And what is for us a great motivation is results like this. You probably have seen this meme. Um, this is an AI-generated image. So basically, it is an, uh, an, an image that was generated from an uh, natural language prompt, which you see down here, and it's really basically spot on. There's small mistakes if you look longer at this image, but basically it's perfect. And um, a couple of years, maybe four or five years ago, something like that was considered science fiction, and now we have this technology and it's possible. And that is all great, but um, also these AI models come with a catch. And uh, for us, very importantly, uh, it is the energy footprint of these models. So they come with a really huge energy footprint. So this is data for ChatGPT, not DALI, which you see here. But, uh, and these are estimates actually, because these numbers are not published, but it's uh, estimated that training a single, um, basically training ChatGPT as uh, a single time costs around 1000 megawatt hours, or that comes down to 300 tons of CO2 or actually many times the CO2 budget um, of a car over its whole life cycle. So this is a problem uh, for multiple reasons. First of all, it makes uh, AI models only accessible to a really small number of global players like big tech companies. Uh, and second, it's just, it doesn't scale, it's not sustainable. So if we extrapolate uh, from what we have today, uh, AI will basically on, be on the same level as the whole transportation sector in terms of the energy that is consumed by it in a couple of years. Um, so the question is, is there sustainable machine learning? So can we um, maintain task performance essentially of these models, but make them more efficient? And our group, also my group thinks, yes, it's possible. And we have a particular way of approaching this problem. Um, by looking at biology. So uh, the human brain, in contrast to a model like ChatGPT, consumes around 20 watts. So it's, it's an orders of magnitude more energy efficient. So what we think is that what, what is possible and what we are trying to do is we start from existing machine learning models and we try to make a transition to efficient AI models. And we do this by uh, exploiting results that come basically out of neuroscience that show how the brain is solving this problem of becoming um, more energy efficient while uh, getting the task performance right as well. And I will now basically show a cross section of what we have been doing in that direction. And I will, I decided for this talk to start uh, on our most neurosciencey project and then go more and more towards machine learning as to uh, talk progresses. Okay, so um, what we have been doing in the past and what we found was actually quite helpful is we looked at actual challenges that come out of uh, neuroscience um, or machine learning for basically from both ends and basically find a specific way how we can address this problem. And if you look at um, neuroscience and you try to compare it to modern machine learning, you see a lot of differences and also some synergies. Um, but one very um, um, very strong difference is that there is uh, um, communication in, in principle in the brain is quite sparse. And we think that this sparsity is very important to, and it is the key basically to this efficiency that we see in the brain. 
And one communication channel that is extremely sparse and which has been overlooked to some extent in the past is if you look at any synapse, so this would be now a, a large pyramidal cell that you would find in the neocortex, for example, of your brain. And these are relatively large uh, neurons, so they can be multiple hundreds of microns long. So the distance here between what is called the dendritic tree up here and the soma, which is down here, which is basically where most of the computation, if you want, is happening. This is a relatively long distance for biological scales, and there's only very sparse information exchange between the two. So if you have a synapse that sits up here, basically that is the input stage of the neuron, uh, it communicates information down to the soma, and then eventually only if there is a action potential triggered down here, this would have enough power to back propagate into the dendritic tree. So the synapse would basically only see the, the presynaptic side, and only very occasionally you would get this strong uh, events that are propagated throughout the whole neuron. So this is very sparse information that arrives there. And the question is now, how can uh, the synapse actually use this information most efficiently and learn from these sparse signals? And then the second very uh, interesting but also confusing observation is that although synapses are, for uh, given how, how abundant they are in the brain, they are still quite costly. So the, the synaptic transition costs the body a lot of energy. Uh, but still, we find that they are extremely noisy. So if you would, uh, this is now really recordings from an actual synapse in the brain. You see that the, it has been triggered here two times. And you see that this, the, the dark curve is the mean. And you see this, if you've looked into these things before, this stereotypically, um, um, yeah, um, kind of these this, uh, stereotypical kernels that we work a lot as, as theoreticians in computational neuroscience. But uh, if you look, this is true only for the mean. If you look at the individual um, uh, trials of this, which are the, uh, the fainter curves in the background, you see that there's a lot of trial-to-trial -trial variability. And actually, um, the probability that a single presynaptic spike gets transmitted by the synapse is around chance level. So they have typically around 50% failure rate, which is also very surprising. So why this high level of noise? And um, in, in biology and, and also in, in behavioral um, uh, sciences, we have models that allow us to deal with these two problems already. So, and uh, this is a model we have been looking into for this project, which is um, active inference. And the active inference can be used exactly for this um, to solve this problem that you have a, an agent or a system that acts under uncertainty. And the way this typically works, I will just very briefly uh, recap this, is that you have an agent like here, and you have a certain environment. And here I just chose this kind of interaction with a very simple physical environment. You have here this ball, and you try to hit this target here. And to do this, um, uh, you have to kind of uh, best make use of the information that is provided you by this environment. And we as humans, as you probably know, we are quite good in, in acting in a physical world, of course, and we are able to solve this task. And more importantly, we are also are able to solve such tasks if, if, it is, uh, if there is a lot of uncertainty involved in this, in this process. For example, let's assume that most of the trajectory of this ball would be uh, happening behind a wall. Um, the, our brains are still quite good in predicting what would be going on in this kind of hidden um, hidden state. Uh, and the way we do this, of course, is because we have large brains that allow that are good models of, of the physical environment, right? So in, in our internal state, our brain uh, would just predict what is happening, and then we wouldn't be very surprised if then the ball, after we threw it behind this wall, appears at a certain location. And we can actually formalize this, and people have been doing that now for many years. We can formalize such um, systems with behaving agents. Uh, and we then typically call, we speak about an internal state, which is basically what our brain thinks is going on in the world, and then uh, the observed state, so actu the actual state of the environment. And we have, uh, and these are physically separated. So our brain is not directly connected with the environment, but it only has. Um, kind of uh, sparse channels for which it com can communicate. One of these is the feedback. So basically, when we see the ball appearing behind this wall, 
which we call the feedback set. And we have actions to basically interact with this environment to kind of probe it for uh, reactions. And this system now of these four, four variables, the internal and external state and the feedback and the action um, can be formalized to ask question what is um, uh, and this is exactly what this active inference framework is used for. Um, and the way this then works is that what you typically want to have, you want to build a good internal model and you do this by minimizing a mismatch between your observations and your internal states. And you can nicely formulate this. So what you typically do is you uh, build a, 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 a model in, in and in the case of the active inference framework, this is a probabilistic model. So you have a probability distribution, uh, which is parameterized by your internal state variables. And this uh, gives you predictions about the external state. And you have the, a model of the true external state that uh, describes in a probabilistic way, again, how the external world interacts with the feedback you receive. And then you can ask questions about any of these variables, essentially. but uh, interesting for us is learning. So basically, you set up a mismatch function, which is this um, free energy functional, which basically describes how well the internal state fits to the, or the internal model fits to the uh, model of the feedback. Uh, and by minimizing this, for example, you can find rules for learning. So basically, what would be good internal state is, that describe this? And this, this has all been done for many years now. Um, but uh, what we realized is that a single synapse is actually in a very similar situation. So if you look at a single synapse that we just magnified here a lot, that is sitting somewhere very remotely on the dendritic tree, it has, um, it has a similar problem. It only sees very sparse information, which is essentially these backpropagating action potentials from the SOMA that arrive at the synapse. Uh, and it has also a a very limited, but still it has this action space of um, injecting uh, a postsynaptic current. So we can essentially, it has all the ingredients. Uh, it also has an internal state, which is the synaptic weight of the, so basically the strength of the synapse. And we can just use the same framework to try to fill out these, um, these variables and to, to answer the same questions. Essentially, how would the uh, synapse most effectively learn in such a situation? And to see this a bit more clearly, you have also here um, basically what the synapse uh, uh, has to interact with is now the, the somatic membrane potential, right? So we have I've, I've uh, shown here one example trace. So this typically starts at a certain uh, pre, uh, postsynaptic spike time where the um, membrane potential of the neuron is reset to some reset potential, and then uh, the so would um, receive many, many inputs. And eventually, at some point, T2, uh, we would, the next spike would be triggered postsynaptically, uh, and the, the neuron fires. But the synapse does, as we, basically, that's the problem we started with. The synapse doesn't see all this, right? What the synapse sees is only these uh, spike times, only when the backpropagation action potentials actually do arrive at the synapse. And everything that is going on in between, because of the long distance between the soma and the synapse and the relatively weak conductance between the soma and the dendrite, um, the synapse doesn't see all that. So it only receives these very sparse events. Um, but with this um, active inference framework, we can still solve the system, right? We can just take all the information that we have available and try to uh, construct the best possible um, uh, learning method for this. Um, and so we, tr we, we exercised this through in this, in this paper that just appeared basically last week. Um, and what, what we found is that if you take a, a simple enough, uh, neuron model, so we used a leaky integrated fire neuron model, you can solve all this analytically. So you can just take the leaky integrated fire neuron and, uh, use it as a, um, as a world model and then just uh, use the synapse with its uh, uh, postsynaptic current that is injected into that neuron as the actor and apply the active inference framework. And what you get then for, uh, for the world model is actually that you can solve all this, as I said, analytically. So you can uh, describe for a leaky integrated fire neuron 
uh, the most likely kind of trajectories that would explain two uh, neighboring postsynaptic spikes. And you get in a distribution over possible trajectories of the membrane potential. It's actually uh, called a uh, einstein ullenbeck bridge model. It's a stochastic process. It has a mean and a variance. So you have basically when you go close to postsynaptic spike events, you have a lot of certainty, of course, about the membrane potential because you know you have been at the threshold or respectively at the previous um, spike time at the resting uh, reset potential. And uh, halfway through these um, uh, um, post post pairs, uh, you have a lot, you have high uncertainty. But then, but um, the the framework is kind of flexible. You can work with any any level of uncertainty, so you can just do the same thing and basically use again this distance measure between your observations and the presumed model, and derive learning rules. Um, and when you look a bit closer into this, um, you see actually that this turns out to be relatively simple for a single synapse. A synapse has a, a yeah, very limited action space, of course. It just injects a, a current of a certain amplitude. That's all, all it does whenever it sees a presynaptic spike. And since this is a programmistic model, it also automatically predicts that this um, action should be should include some variabilities. So you get here a probability distribution over the action spaces. The synapse, when there is a presynaptic spike, injects uh, a postsynaptic current of a certain amplitude. And then you can just use this framework to fill out uh, with this uh, einstein ullenbeck uh, bridge uh, what would, uh, after you observe the, the two neighboring postsynaptic spikes that are kind of adjacent to this presynaptic spike, the one before and the one after, you can just construct this einstein ullenbeck bridge and read off what would have been the optimal current that the synapse should have injected um, to explain this firing behavior, if you want. And then you can just compute the mismatch between these two probability distributions and directly derive a, uh, an optimal synaptic weight change that uh, in the future allows the synapse to explain better um, what the uh, um, uh, this behavior in the in future uh, examples. Um, and the nice thing is that if you do this, I will show this a bit larger in the next uh, uh, slide. Since everything here just depends on these uh, pre and post spike times, you get a very simple learning rule that does all that, but everything you sh that is shown here uh, then only depends on these two time differences. So del del delta T1, which is the difference between the uh, next postsynaptic spike and the presynaptic spike, and the delta T2, which is the difference between the two adjacent uh, postsynaptic spikes. It's a relatively simple, it, it, this is also called a triplet STDP rule that only depends on a, a post pre post pairing. Okay. So looking a bit closer at this, this is basically how this uh, learning rule looks. And you see that it depends on the um, pre and post synaptic spike time, which, on, which is this dimension here. So it basically fa facilitates if um, the post synaptic neuron fires uh, shortly after the pre synaptic spike arrives. Uh, but it also has a dependency on the, uh, on the second um, basically on the, on the frequency of the postsynaptic firing. So if the postsynaptic firing is denser, you would get more excitation. And if it's um, sparser, uh, you would get more depression. And this is actually very well compatible with um, biological uh, learning curves. So you, there's this, for example, this very famous result on spike time dependent plasticity where people looked at just pre-post pairings and they found that this kind of uh, two-sided exponential curve where um, if uh, anti-correlated um, um, pairing leads to depression and the correlated pairing leads to uh, facilitation. So this is our model and this is um, experimental data. But since it, uh, it is a triplet rule, you can also explain other experimental um, observations. Um, so this is a this is another pairing protocol where uh, pre and post synaptically um, 
neurons were brought to fire with different frequencies. So these are Poisson um, firing rates of pre and post um, uh, neurons. And you see that this is a very detailed model that was published a couple of years ago uh, that shows how the synapse should behave. And we see at least qualitatively that we get a very similar behavior in, with our model that was derived really from first principles. OK, and then um, how far can we take this? So this is, of course, a very detailed synapse model. Um, but we, sh we could show in this paper, actually, that you can, even with that relatively simple, completely synoptic synapse local uh, learning rules, you can still solve kind of complex tasks. So here, we, this is one of the examples we, we did there. So we showed that uh, you can basically learn uh, a behavior. So this is um, a recurrent network that interacts again with an with an environment. So this is was a 3D, just a 3D space, and we trained the model to follow basically this trajectory uh, through this 3D environment from a start to an end goal. Uh, and this the the curves you see in the background are basically the trajectories that are generated uh, by the network after training. So you see that it, um, it's not doing a perfect job, but it's uh, able to follow these trajectories. Um, and interestingly, what we found is that um, uh, we played here with the, uh, with, with the strength of the stochasticity in the synapses. So coming back to this original question, how can the network um, make use of this variability uh, in synaptic release? And we actually found that variabil variability in many of the examples we showed in the paper is actually crucial to get the task performance right. So here also, um, so as I said at the beginning, synapses have typically a, a release probability of around uh, 50%. So they are, they, have, they are very noisy. And we could show that um, uh, actually, this is also the regime where the task performance was best in, in our experiments. OK, um, so this is all nice. Uh, but of course, these are relatively simple models. So they're, it's, it's basically triplet STP, STDP. And sooner or later, you will reach a limit um, with such, approach, uh, such a, approaches. But what we could show is that um, basically, you can follow this principle of active um, inference uh, and apply it to every synapse. And this would give you, uh, yeah directly an, uh, an example of uh, synaptic plasticity mechanisms um, and, uh, and it's then basically a mechanism how the network can still learn up to this level of uh, up to the behavioral level um, with these extremely sparse learning signals. So the question now would be um, this works now for these simple examples, but what is actually um, how can we reach uh, high task performance that we see in machine learning, but still make use of these uh, high levels uh, of, uh, of low communication rates? And this brings, us, brings me to my uh, second uh, uh, topic I want to talk about, uh, where we looked a bit more general into these mechanisms of, um, of spike generation that you see in biological neurons. So going back to this uh, very nice simulation, um, you see that essentially there is this uh, spike generating mechanism that sits at the soma, and only if the membrane threshold um, at the soma is ex um, exceeds a certain threshold, uh, the neuron would um, communicate the spike. And we now looked at the communication of the spike back to the synapse, but of course it goes also in the other direction, and also that is very important to uh, to basically. Um, efferent neurons that come after this one. Um, and this is a principle that it could, Im could be applied to basically any neuron model uh, to translate, translate it, it uh, into a, a spiking neuron. And we played with this idea now for, for a couple of years to basically just extract this spiking me mechanism and, and try to build it into other systems. So if you think about the spiking mechanism, it is a, um, the, the gist of it is relatively simple, right? So you have the membrane potential. 
And then you have a certain threshold, and when the threshold is crossed, you would generate the spike, and then you would reset back the uh, membrane potential. Uh, so you could write uh, down a circuit diagram that looks something like that. So you have the internal state U, uh, which is the, the membrane potential. And then whenever this you have a mechanism that watches this internal state for, and when the threshold is crossed, um, you trigger an event to basically uh, allow the outside world to observe this uh, internal state for a very brief moment, but then you immediately re reset back um, the membrane potential or the internal state so that you don't immediately spike again. Okay? Um, and uh, exactly. So basically, you, you distill this uh, spike mechanism into this gating mechanism and the instantaneous reset. And now this block can be applied basically to any model, and we just tried to apply it to a relatively simple machine learning model. Um, the GIU, which is a recurrent uh, a network model that has uh, that fits our needs, so it's a recurrent model, so it has a notion of time, which we need for a spike mechanism, and it also has an internal state, and the GIU does this in a somewhat complicated way. It has it is kind of an attention mechanism over time that allows the um, essentially the neuron to uh, decide which information in the input are, are important to keep for, fu for the future. And it does this in a very clever way so that it gets um, kind of good task performance and was state of the art until recently, basically until Transformers were published. And we then tried to just um, add this spiking mechanism uh, to a vanilla GIU network um, and look basically if the ta how the task performance um, is kind of trade-off against the, uh, the sparsity we can achieve with this. And obviously, if you do that, you do achieve uh, sparsity in the forward. So if you would take now this model and roll it out over time, so basically this is now for two u two units interacting, so this would be the internal state of one unit. And only if this threshold is uh, triggered here, basically the this unit would broadcast information to other units as biological neurons do. Uh, and then the other uh, neurons would receive that. But uh, their outputs would be silent until another uh, neuron actually um, triggers an output uh, and so on, right? So in the, in the forward mode, so when you, when you look at uh, the activity of these neurons, clearly this is uh, sparse. Uh, conveniently, uh, also, this is true for learning. So if you do um, learning by uh, error back propagation, which is the standard thing to do now with deep neural networks, you can also do this over time. So that would be back propagation through time then. Also, then you see that you can save a lot of the sparsity for learning. And uh, to, to implement this, we used actually a surrogate gradient approach. So basically, um, th the problems you have with these spikes is that they are, if you treat them as um, Dirac delta functions, they are not differentiable. So you have to do some tricks. But the simplest one is that you just replace uh, these delta functions with something uh, that is a proxy for the true gradient. Uh, which, for example, can be just such a tri triangular shape, uh, which you can basically freely choose, and you have a tuning parameter, which is this epsilon, which gives you the width of these triangulars. Uh, and then you can just use this as a proxy for training, and this works reasonably well, and this has been studied um, quite a bit in the past. And we did basically the same thing. And depending on this epsilon now, you can uh, get higher or lower levels of sparsity, uh, but definitely non-zero sparsity for these models. Okay, so the question now is how well does this perform? So we applied it to a, a number of um, benchmark tasks. So what you see here is um, DVS gesture recognition. So this is a event-based camera. Uh, you see that these, so under, other than a conventional camera, uh, only um, pixels that change over time are activated. You see here the on and off events of a person doing uh, this clapping and this waving motion. 
And if you would roll this out over time, it would look something like this. So you get all these on and off events over time in the XY space. And if you would then run this through an EGRU, you would also see these high levels of sparsity, which is ex exactly what we want. So you see here, uh, this is a multi-layer EGRU model. You see that basically everything that is white here is zeros, and these are exactly the zeros we want. This is the computation you save uh, by processing this input. And actually, um, looking at task performance, at that time, this model was the best performing uh, machine learning model that was published. So we got uh, basically ahead of state of the art. A, a year ago, I think by now it's already outdated, but um, back then it was uh, the best performing model. But more importantly for us, it was also a very sparse model, right? So you can uh, save up to 76% in, uh, in activities, so activity sparsity, and also in uh, on the backward side. And we also applied this for natural language modeling. Um, and also here, importantly, so we had here this uh, epsilon parameter, which is this width of the surrogate gradient. We could show uh, that there is a regime where there's backward sparsity. So you get zero, you can exploit zeros in the in learning, but you still would get uh, the best uh, task performance for this model. Yeah, how is it time wise? I think I have only 10 more minutes, right? Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, and then we applied this also to a neuromorphic architecture. So we, we implemented this on the Spinnaker 2 chip and we could show that this actually saves up to 94% in energy with this language modeling task. Okay. Uh, yeah, so then I want to maybe speed up a bit. Um, so one, one thing we did not talk about uh, a lot in this paper is that when we treated this DVS gesture task, um, what we did there is was something we did not like that much. We still uh, used a frame-based input for, for the EGI use to get it working. So basically, when you have these DVS gestures, um, you get these nice events, right? So you have these, these pixel events, which are these on and off um, signals. Um, and they are really a lot. So there's there's uh, up to a million of these events per uh, for, per data sample. So one of these wave motions can generate a million event. So to handle this, uh, we had to collapse them into frames. So basically, we were sending, we were collecting these events, accumulating them in short frames of a couple of milliseconds, and then sending it into the uh, EGRU. It would, of course, be much nicer to directly use these events and do a full event-based model from beginning to end. And this was a problem that worried us a bit and that we really wanted to solve. So this is, was then yeah, my, is going to be my third challenge. So how can you actually do direct processing of asynchronous event streams in neuromorphic sensors, like in the uh, DVS gesture task? And if you look at, the, at this clapping motion again, you see what, what the challenge here really is, because you have here this motion, which lasts maybe around a second or so. And the, the machine learning algorithm now has to keep track of these very long time dependencies, right? A pixel that lights up here in one moment, a million, some, a million time steps later, or a million events later, some other pixel might be related to that one. And all these very, um, spread out information has to be kind of integrated by the machine learning model. Sorry. And yes, so yes. You could, so the, uh, it should be, maybe we leave more time for questions. So if you could maybe finish in three minutes, it would be nice because then we could have uh, more time for, for questions. But I think that this is okay, very interesting. So I don't want to cut you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, I tried to speed up. Yeah, I may, I can maybe just jump through it and we can then discuss it. I mean, this is published anyways, so we can talk about it. Um, okay, so what we did essentially in a, in a nutshell, we used deep state space models. So you see here now already the uh, rolled out over time version of a deep space state space models. 
they are relatively recent machine learning models. Um, and they have been used for conventional frame-based data. But basically, what we could show in this uh, paper is that they are very well suited for event-based data. So they work very, extremely well with spiking. And the, we develop a couple of tricks there to make this work. And one of these tricks is that you can uh, basically work with state-space models. But because of their properties, we can go into details um, in an kind of a, a, by jumping basically through times from one event to the next. And you can basically just fill out what comes in between by very simple uh, manipulations. And the bottom line is basically that this works uh, on raw data with these billions of events um, without convolutions or any pre-processing. And we actually even beat transformers that have been published very recently on pure event-based processing. And we also got the best paper award at the ICONS conference this year. <laughs> um, so this is Mark, who was the first author on this paper. Uh, and then maybe just in 30 seconds, uh, we then were wondering, this is our third, uh, fourth challenge, what are actually computational capacities of these state space models? Uh, and this is something we looked very recently into it, because they seem to have very intriguing properties. And also, they are conceptually very simple. Um, so you can uh, analyze them analytically. And we were looking into the capabilities of these models to do in-context learning. Um, and if you're interested in this, we have a preprint out on that one as well. It's essentially, in-context learning is an ability of a network that emerges just by after learning, basically. So for example, here, you have a pre-trained language model, and then you query it with something. Let's jump directly to the second one. You have, uh, you have trained a model just to predict the next word in a sequence of words. But then in the end, you ask it to translate something from English to French. And because it has learned to predict things, uh, after this prompt, the, the, the natural thing to do would be actually to answer in, in French. And um, large language models are actually able to do this. So just by prompting them with the right prompts, you can program them to do something essentially, without relearning. And we started looking into this in more detail. So what are basically the properties of state space models that allow it to do these things? And we found, uh, so this was mostly work by, led by Anand Supramoni. Um, we found actually that um, you can, uh, just by, by looking at the, um, how, how the state evolves over time, you can actually re relate this back to a linear regression model and show that uh, uh, state-space models can very naturally do gradient descent on linear regression. And more importantly, uh, you can then use this to make prediction on what would be the actual um, uh, implementations. How would the network solve a certain in-context learning task? And we show that these uh, constructions that come out from this uh, gradient descent idea actually match very well to the actual um, uh, yeah, network dynamics that we find just by training this, the same model. So basically, that we can predict how the network would construct these uh, in-context learning machines. And yeah, we are very, currently very excited about this. And if you're interested, uh, yeah, follow up on this. Okay, so yeah, sorry for this very quick uh, going through the last two, but yeah, I wanted to show you these three challenges we've been working on. The first going from this very um, neuroscience inspired idea for synaptic processing with uh, active inference, and then also our work on EGIU for um, uh, sparse communication in machine learning models, and the last two where we looked more into recent models, like state space models, and their, their properties for uh, yeah, working with spikes and other problems. OK. So I want to thank yeah, the many people that have been involved in this. So um, my group here in Bochum, and also my collaborators in Dresden, so Mark, um, and also Anand in the Royal Holloway, and Christian Tetzloff in Göttingen. Cool. And yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, David. Um, I think that kind of we're 
community is uh, aware of these recent works on SSMs and we're all excited. So I think a lot of people will uh, probably uh, follow up on that with you, including myself. And um, so we have uh, questions. We have five minutes, six minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I'll just start with the one that is uh, voted the most and I will do this. All right, so I just read a question for you. Really nice that you can get triplet SDDP models from active inference principles. What can you say about the stability of these learning rules? Does it succumb to the usual Hebian runaway uh, potentiation or um, or is it stable from first principles? Uh, yeah, maybe I can go back to this. So yes, we used, um, we used not too many tricks to stabilize this, so we had um, for, so for, for, for the field forward case, it was reasonably stable. So the thing is that because the, uh, the learning rule is aware of the parameters of the, uh, of the SOMA, if you want, that was one of the assumptions we just took for granted. So basically that the, the two match up to each other. So that means every synapse is kind of playing fair from, from the beginning and is trying to make the SOMA spike at the right times. So in the feedforward networks, you didn't have to do anything on top of this to make it stable. For recurrent networks, we did the usual thing. So we used an, um, an adaptive threshold to not make it run away and, and stabilize. But there were no other tricks on top of that that we had mm -hmm. to do. Okay. So answer would probably be yes, it's reasonably stable. There would be also the other side that you could um, use the same framework to uh, to write down the optimal equation for the adaptive threshold, actually. That would be cool, but we didn't do that. So we really focused on the signups. Cool. Mm -hmm. So the next question, or um, sorry, actually, I think this one is the good. So it's great to see an event-based version of the free energy principle. Do you see any advantage in using spikes in the model's energy footprint compared to an analog solution? Is it at the expense of performance? Um, this is a hard question because there's not so many. I mean, we, we really went down to the lowest level here, right? Um, so the advantage is this, you get extremely sparse communication from the beginning here, right? So that, in, and that typically translates into an energy advantage, I would say. So in, in, if I talk to people like Melika that work in, in neuromorphics, they typically tell me that what is expensive in a chip is to move around information. I guess this is still true in the in twenty. It's still true. <laughs> it's still true. So in that sense, you would expect that this is um, also very energy efficient because you're not moving around information that you don't have to, right? The network never reads out. So the synapse never reads out the membrane potential of the SOMA. It only communicates in this minimal information if you want. But we don't, we have not implemented it in, on any chip yet. So it's, this is still something we All right. don't know cool. for sure. Yeah. Hmm? All right. Um, I had a question which I think disappeared because I messed up, I think. Maybe I can do this. Uh -huh, yeah. Okay, cool. So yesterday, we heard so you know there was a postdoc from uh, from benjamin greve they worked on this deep feedback mm -hmm. control um so basically all of these local learning rules um that kind of do some kind of target prop like um uh, uh local learning rules so so basically the, the, the they solve the spatial credit assignment through nudging mm -hmm. the neuron to to do what it's supposed to do and then create uh, the errors locally. So I was just wondering, um, how does your model compare to that, or what is the benefit of you know doing this kind of active inference based uh, triplet HTTP compared to those models? Um, um, yeah. So if I know this, um, if I understood this method correctly, this was a very similar. Is, it can be understood in the same kind of theoretical framework. So these nudging ideas are very, um, in, if you want, the synapse is also doing kind of a nudging here, right? So it's trying to inject these stochastic currents into the postsynaptic neuron. 
And by doing so, it's kind of doing a trial and error game. So it tries to find, with these random actions, tries to find the regime that, that explains best how the post-synoptic firing works. Mm -hmm. So the kind of the, the synapses and the neuron together find an agreement on how they work together, if you want. Uh, and again, we are just looking at this lowest level, whereas most other people have been that looked at these nudging ideas or these uh, active influence ideas, they, um, they are really coming from the behavioral level. And we try to completely come from the other side. Mm -hmm. I hope there is a nice way to meet with this in, kind of in the middle that you mm -hmm. approach this, this theoretical framework from the behavioral side and from the synoptic side or the most the most basic elements and then find a, a path through from beginning to end but all right good cool yeah. um great i think uh so we have one minute left i can maybe just do one more question um or actually we don't have any time left but i i still do <laughs> one more question could you elaborate on sparse back propagation through time, specifically, how do you handle off diagonal entries in the Jacobian that often becomes dense across multiple layers or time steps? Okay, this was this goes probably for the EGIU, right? I would think so because that's the only place. That's where we where we use sparse back propagation through time. Oof, that's very technical. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, and because we're out of time, why why don't you guys maybe take this offline? If you think it's too technical and you cannot explain it easily. Uh, I think uh, I don't have a quick answer on that one. Um, yeah, I think we would have to discuss it. All right, good. Great. So then I think we can go to the, to the next session. And I'll see you there. <laughs> Okay, thank you. you.